Hi again, everyone, and welcome to the Outreach Broadcast Network. I'm Mike Hayes. Today, we're diving into a topic that's been causing concern in many localities across the United States, the alarming trend of retail store closures. As we witness the shifting landscape of brick and mortar businesses, we find ourselves asking, is there any way to reverse this trend and revitalize our local economies? Today, we have the privilege of delving into a groundbreaking study conducted by Oxford University, shedding light on the remarkable success story of Espo, Finland. Espo has earned the title of the most sustainable city in Europe, boasting achievements not only in business, but also in their environmental practices, city organizations, and overall community well-being. But how did they achieve this remarkable turnaround? And more importantly, what lessons can we draw from their success to address the challenges faced by our local businesses here in the United States? Joining us for this insightful discussion is Iro Vara, a professor of Oxford University who led the research on ESPO's success, and MBA candidate Nakul Thomas, who has been actively involved in understanding the intricacies of this transformative journey. Together, they will help me unravel the strategies that turn ESPO into a sustainable haven and explore how these principles can be applied to breathe new life into our local retail scenes by making our cities havens of this new superpower of artificial intelligence and narrative storytelling strategies. These have been studied for decades at Oxford University, especially under the Dean of Oxford University, Dr. Sumitra Dutta. Right now, get ready for an eye-opening conversation on building resilient, fostering sustainability, and reinvigorating our local economies. First of all, let me say what sparked the conversation between Nakula and, and me was my wife and I went to Arinda and we went to this cool little bar with music. And on the way there, I saw that probably 70% of the retail storefronts were shuttered. And I went, oh my goodness. And this is a wealthy community. And that's kind of what sparked your conversation with Nakul. So that's kind of how this got started. And, and then I just seen so much devastation in San Francisco by all the shuttered retail stores. And I thought, we don't want that here. So what can we do to take action? So, Because I'm a real action guy. Uh, and I, I don't say that lightly. I mean, that's just from the time I was 22, I was raised at NBC TV and radio networks in New York to be a go getter, really. You were only as good as your last show. And if you didn't get the story, you know, you weren't doing your job. So you really had to go for things. I end up with a great staff and crew. We ended up winning two Peabody Awards for documentaries that we produced for NBC, The Battered American Marriage and The Fourth Horseman of the Apocalypse, World Hunger. Sports Illustrated wrote me up as being one of the most impactful interviewers of peak performers on earth because I interviewed the world's top athletes at the peak of their career at the Super Bowl, World Series, et cetera. But I've also spent about 15 years in the TV infomercial industry, interviewing people and selling products through interviews. So I've been on all sides of media, you name it, and I kind of been there. Enough about me. We've got a lot to talk about because we see this as a huge opportunity and we want to learn as much as fast as we can. Welcome back to the podcast listening show. It's your friend in commerce, Mike Hayes. Today, we're diving into a seriously cool topic. The Oxford University and Professor Euro Vara's game-changing research on using narrative storytelling as a strategic tool for creating a brighter future for everyone, from families, small businesses, or large ones, groups, and even for cities like mine or yours. Just in listening to this, you'll discover how you can become a rock star in your city with the simplicity of podcast listening strategies of getting the right people to listen to the right podcasts. Right now, we've got who I believe is the world's top academic strategy expert in Professor Euro Vara. This Oxford University researcher is like a rock star of narrative storytelling strategies. 
and to make sure I deliver everything that I can from this interview for you, I've got my next door neighbor and friend, Nakul Thomas, who's doing his MBA at Oxford University and is knee deep in this strategy for mergers and acquisitions. Nakul knows Professor Vara personally, so we've got some serious inside scoops for you. Together, in a common sense way, we're going to unravel the power of narrative storytelling, how it's shaking things up in the business world, and why it's a game changer for us, for our cities, and for all organizations. So turn off all distractions and get ready for an enlightening conversation here on Podcast Listening. Professor Vara, it's great to meet you, and welcome to the podcast. So let me again say that it's a huge uh, honor and privilege, and, and, and it's just great to meet you as well. But I'll start from, from now by saying that I've been here at Oxford for about five years now. So also, by the way, I've spent some time at Stanford University, and I'll get to that in the sense of I know a little bit of, about the Bay Area, so it's not entirely new to me either. And as Nakul knows very well, uh, lately I've been mostly interested in or about, I don't know, 15 years, 20 years in new approaches to strategy work, which is to see strategy work uh, from new angles, which 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 I needed really to, 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 to deal with the big challenges where we're facing. So that's the big, big pra practical reason for that. There's a theoretical reason as well in the sense of feel that we need to update our understanding of what, what strategy and decisions are all about. So I've been looking at things like open strategy and especially important have been these narrative storytelling perspectives that we're going to focus on here, but but also other things that we discussed in class. And then, you know, I was really happy about our conversations here, no bullshit approaches. So let me uh, uh, try to summarize for people that are new to this information that basically what we're talking about is, if I'm correct, is the strategy of using a narrative story about a future outcome and then getting the buy-in from the story and evolving the story to perfect it and fine tune it and recruit more people into the story so that it becomes a reality. Is that a pretty good summary? And what was the outcome of doing that? Yeah, I think it's a great summary, and and I'm I'm so enthusiastic about that that I'm probably going to all kinds of sidelines here, but it's definitely about the future, and strategies are usually about the future. There's a point for this particular city organization because they want to distinguish themselves and probably need to do this. It goes well with the idea of, of a narrative that there's a there's history, there's now, and then there's the future. But it's definitely about the future. And, and the point, I think, is that both the content of the story in terms of what's in that, in terms of the essence of the strategy is enabled something that encourages people to do the, do the things that are needed. But there's also the, the approach they have taken to do, which is to not see it as a story that the top guys, the mayor and his team would develop and then share with everyone else. But it would be more like a living story so that in this process, the story is so the content and the nature of the story would also be shaped by by those who are participating in it. I, I think it has has created a lot of a lot of excitement and, and a lot of good things in terms of of encouraging people in these different parts of ESP organization to be bolder in terms of moving forward with the future in mind. From my bird's eye view, what has been the biggest biggest achievement. But I think that's that's been the to me the, the most important effect. Well, I, I do have some questions about the of what was happening at Espo at that time, and now with new technology that has to do with storytelling and media, and really some of the details of it that are about expansion and game playing and recruiting all the generations and really getting everyone involved. But before I do that, let me ask Nick Cool, who has been a student and a fan, if I may, to add anything or ask any question. I think this is great. I, you know, I've, I've heard you know, Euro talking about living strategy and kind of how, you know, even in the corporate world, how this can make a big difference. And I feel like, you know, this type of mindset of inclusion and a cumulative understanding of purpose, I have seen makes more momentum, even in my line of work, which is more on the M&A integration side of things after the deal is done. In our type of work, when we deem something a success is when the culture itself has bought into the transformation. With awesome education like this, you know, we 
when we go into deals like this now, you know, during implementation, we're looking at a bottoms up approach of how do we make sure that we can get the organization cohort designed in a way to provide inputs to the strategy that we can deploy as the organization grows and matures. The results have a completely different meaning. In terms of which sector we deploy this type of outlook on strategy, I think it definitely renders a much better outcome than looking at it highly from a top-down perspective and, and kind of rolling it out that way. So I'm 100% sold on you know, the way we look at new ways of strategy building. What if I told you that right here in our own backyard, all of you have the potential to be the epicenter of something huge. I'm talking about the next big renaissance. And guess what? It will be powered by artificial intelligence. I know, I know. We might not all have this massive dream yet, but what if we did? What if a small town like mine, Lafayette, California, became the place where AI isn't just a buzzword, but rather a force that brings us all together, creating a community unlike any other? I'm just asking you to picture this, Lafayette. Picture the haven, the mecca, heck, even the Florence of a new AI-powered renaissance. It's not about robots taking over. It's about us and the heart of the people of Lafayette shaping the future that we want to see. So here's the deal, my friends. We're on a podcast listening mission to ignite these creative sparks and to get everyone, leaders, citizens, young and old, thinking about the incredible potential we have right here. This is not just a story. It's a call to action. Lafayette and small towns everywhere. Let's dream big, think bold, and set the stage, the stage for an AI-powered renaissance that starts right here, right now uniquely situated in Lafayette. We are semi-rural and we have a great downtown. What we want is to keep our semi-rural quality but a vibrant downtown to have the best of both worlds. I've never been there. I've, I've almost been there. I've, I've been on, on the other side. I've been at Berkeley and my son yeah. was also studying there and I got married in Berkeley. So it's not that far of Lafayette as to be the mecca of, of AI. I think that's a great, great vision, almost like a like a purpose related, huge, big, big idea. Then I, I think that's that's a great one to be at the focal point for, for for the new strategy for the whole community. If that's then linked with this or approached from this perspective of engagement and allowing people to be involved in whatever capacity they can do this or are willing to do that, then I think that would be great. And related to what I, what I was saying previously, it would be fun also then to use AI in this process in a way that hasn't been done before because it hasn't been available in the way it's it's now. Or so there would be like a double play that it's, it's the, you know, here's the future of AI. This is what our community wants to be. And at the same time, doing it in a way that would allow people to be involved if it's a narrative approach or a story or stories or whatever, but, but used AR to the extent possible. Eero, I'm going to ask you, because you've done massive research on ESPO and you personally have been involved with the human side of it. From my understanding of it, it was about, geez, our, our tourism is down. We need more traffic into our city and we need more vibrancy and we've got to get some things moving here. That was kind of my understanding of it. And in light of that and in light of Lafayette, and now you've heard us talk a little bit about technology, help me make maybe a case to the city of Lafayette about your history, your experiences and research and us as residents living in it and interested in technology, how can we summarize this into a holistic narrative and story and moving forward with where we are at the moment and the need to be able to handle rapid change and shift the mindsets? I, I think there's a lot to learn from, from cases such as ESPO. It's a real case and it's almost like an experiment, a very unique one. I, I was about to say, like, I know of 
no other where they would have taken the idea of narrative or story so seriously as a new way of understanding strategy. And not only that, but they consistently and systematically involve people, be they internal or external stakeholders in these processes. And, and it's clearly had a lot of positive impacts in many, many different ways. I would also want to emphasize that ESPO is, is very much about innovation and technology. So that, that's really like one of the hubs in Northern Europe, at least they would like to see it that way. It's very much about innovation as well, in addition to these other things. But, but of course, it's a city. Cities are different from companies because they have a lot of different kinds of goals and and a lot of different kinds of needs. So it's actually hard to strategize because strategizing usually means, you know, prioritizing something over other things. But again, I think the main main take has been that this has been very successful in, in, in making people part of strategy work, which to me is like the ultimate thing you want to have because you can have a great strategy, but it doesn't really help you much if people don't act accordingly. That's the underlying behind this kind of, you know, if people are involved, they feel they can difference with the strategy that they are part of. That That's just absolutely great. I am so glad that we got a that chance to talk. And I think these types of conversations are very beneficial to kind of making that next stage of work happen. I think from, from the takeaway here, there are a lot of parallels between Espo and Lafayette, Lafayette, San Francisco, and there is a gap. We've identified the gap, Mike, in terms of what needs to happen. And we have a vehicle in terms of how we can do it and why we need to do it. Now the question becomes, where are we going? Where do we want to end up 5, 10, 15 years from now? And I think as a community, if we can come together and use a lot of these resources that Eero has given us, perspective, and kind of the why, and the growing need for why, to preserve it for our kids and the generations after that. That's a great starting point for all of us to come down. And then if Lafayette is your vision, Mike, of a technology mecca, and how do we use AI being the next shiny penny on the block to help us with that, that's even a more accelerated and hopefully a more meaningful way of getting to where ESPO is today after 10, 15 years. Taking that meaningful reason as to why people need to be involved and kind of defining the purpose and the goals, getting that together with tools like AI, I think will help us really get to a, a, a state of maturity and beyond for, for us and the next generations. If you really love your city and you really care about your family and your future, I don't care what age you are. Wouldn't you want to be part of, you know, the story about what your future and your city can become? And I think we've got to use technology as part of that storytelling to recruit and, and excite the imaginations of the younger generations. I think that helping the younger people of Lafayette, they're going to be teaching AI in high school before long. They got to figure out how to do that. And to recruit them, what do you want the future of your city to be? Become involved in the, the narrative storytelling about it to make it become reality. And to me, we got to have technology if we're going to reach the younger generation to, to recruit them into the story. My kids, my, uh, my seven-year-old is very receptive to technology. And it's, um, I guess the way I would put it is they process a derivative way of giving information to them much faster than I do. I have to admit to that. And what I mean by that is kids already know what to expect from, let's say, a show or a, a, a live cast or something like that. They, they seem like they have an expectation that they're hoping to get. And that is conveyed to them so quickly through you know, interpretations of that material in the technology space that I was used to, which is someone explaining to me in plain English, you know, what they mean and how, you know, what the outcome should be. So their brains are wired in a way that is receiving information so then they can process on their end. If you look at it from a graphical point of view, their amplitude, even though it's the same wave, their amplitude is higher than ours in terms of what to expect as starting point of information and then processing that. And I feel like if we don't get 
with that curve from this generation to meeting that next generation, we will lose our way of transitioning what they need to know and then how they need to excel with that information. So incorporating technology and what AI can do in terms of optimizing the technology is going to help. The rudimentary way in which we convey purpose, value, goals has to come from the origins of where it came from. Because if that's lost, then everything becomes a very robotic exercise and meanings lost. Sometimes I sit back with my daughter and do you know why we want to do the multiplication? Yeah, because this could be oranges someday, and then you have to deal with 12 people that want to eat this orange. So I get the fact that calculators can figure that out, but you don't, do you understand the meaning behind why? That pause with the human intervention, I feel like provides that depth, which we may lose if we employ AI in a way that takes it from zero to 100. I think the ideal way of thinking about these stories or narratives unfolding could be that there's a beginning and, and then a lot of people would be invited to share their ideas. This is what they did with ESPO 10 years ago with, um, you know, just web-based surveys. So people, you know, provide their inputs. What do you see the future like? And then you analyze that so that there are some themes emerging. But there, there's where AI could be very helpful and thousands of inputs from people in Lafayette or other stakeholders. You know, AI can help to put it all together and provide I see, all kinds of storylines. And maybe there's a next next iteration as well. It then goes, what's our strategy really going to be like? And that could, again, feed back to those different representations. I'm just saying that it would be yeah. fantastic um, and using AI the right way, in my view, in that appetite is, is, is grown. So uh, I really want to follow up as to what, what you guys will, where you will move from from, from this this stage. I, I honestly think that there's a, there's a unique opportunity uh, first of all, from this more narrow perspective of like how to do strategy in terms of the process, thinking of it as a narrative. And then secondly, having as many stakeholders involved as possible. And thirdly, involving AI in this. But of course, I also learned that, you know, there's a really great case for focusing on AI as the well, making Lafayette become the mecca of AI knowing that it's the Bay Area, I could see easily many, many, many things coming together real nice here. Uh, cool Thomas, my neighbor and friend and an MBA student at Oxford and Ira Ovara, Professor Ira Ovara of Oxford. Thank you for joining us and stay tuned. Thank you so much. See you soon. Thank you. Hello again, everyone. And thanks for joining us here on the Outreach Broadcast Network. Everything you need to know about AI, business networking, and beyond.